unfolding the eternal excellences, the hidden insights of the truth, and the depth of the riches of wisdom and knowledge. The Bible says, I have cleansed thee by the word. I have not pointed to your weaknesses. He says, I have cleansed thee by the word. I have pointed to your strength. And this is your strength, that I am Christ in you, the hope of glory. The glory of freedom, the glimpses into eternity. The gospel is not supposed to be an assumption. It's not supposed to be just a mere presupposition. Truth is older than language, but the word of God is way deeper than any human language. And now, Apostle Grace with the word. Somebody shout hallelujah. Now the Bible says in Psalms 11 verses 3, the Bible says that if the foundations be destroyed, what can the righteous do? If the foundations be destroyed, what can the righteous do? If the foundations be destroyed, what can the righteous do? This is a question that the psalmist asked. It's a fundamental question that the psalmist asked. We cannot speak of some things in scripture, not speak of other things. That's why I said that may the heart of God be revealed and my heart too as his minister to see that this is spoken out of love and true, true, true concern for the body of Christ. You know, many of us live in a world where we don't care about anything that happens outside our marriages. We don't care about anything that happens outside our jobs. We don't care about anything that happens outside our businesses. We don't care about anything that happens outside our careers. We don't care about anything that happens outside our schools. We don't care about anything that happens outside our relationships. I've met many Christians who don't have concern for their, for the church of Jesus Christ. Who don't have concern for the body of Christ. Who don't have concern for the Christendom at large. Who think that the church can be affected and continue to be affected and we just watch praise God at a particular time before we even say or oh, do what must be done when the foundations are broken primarily our hearts must be examined before God because when your heart is examined before God and you know for a fact that you are doing it in line with the will and purposes of God with a true conviction of his love an intention that men be saved and restored and delivered, then it is worth certain things be brought to the table. Why? Because we are living in a generation where now people outside are starting to question salvation. We are living in a time where people outside are starting to question our faith. Where when you say that I'm born again, you're telling them that you're fake. Well, when you say that you're born again and you're a believer, you're telling them that there's something wrong with you. Either in the way you think or in the way you act. You're telling them that you're poor. When you tell them that you're born again, you're telling them that you are wasted. When you tell them that you're born again, you're telling them that you don't have a mind, you don't have a conviction, you don't have a backbone, you don't have a character, you have nothing in you. Today, sometimes the badge of salvation is not as strongly understood and interpreted in present day like it was many years ago. Back in the day when a man came and said, I'm a pastor, you'd respect that. Today when somebody says, I'm a pastor, people start to pull themselves back. Back in the day when challenges came through societies, people would say, you know what, go to church and pray. Today when you invite somebody and tell them, you know what, come to church. People say, you know what, I got tired of church. We tried it, we got done with this thing called church. Do you know how many people no longer come to church because of us? Do you know how many people are denouncing our faith because of us? And then you can rebuke them and say, but you know, you didn't get born again on a person. You got born again for Christ. Yes, and that is all understood. But we're not going to go into their souls and heal the wounds that are there. Because the wounds are still apparent and they continue to grow. 
Now everything, innocently or not, sometimes the church is innocent, but sometimes it's so that the foundations have been shaken. The foundations have been destroyed. The foundations have been frustrated. The foundations have gone out of course. And now sometimes the righteous ask themselves, what can we do? There are things that happen sometimes in the body of Christ. And then we're like, but what can we do? Because we don't want to be misunderstood. We don't want to be taken in ways that we don't, are not necessarily what we intended to imply. But there is something wrong and it is derailing the faith. It's taking us back. It's, it's killing us. We have questions. We have questions. And somehow we just don't seem to find answers. And the things that are disturbing the body of Christ, they are foundational. But you see, not many of us go to the foundation because we prefer to scratch the surfaces of simple breakthrough. You know, God is going to help you and that's okay. God can help you. God can get you a job. He can get you a wife and a child and children. He can get you a car and everything. But you see, at the end of the day, the soul of nations, different nations, when you look at the souls and foundations of the nations that profess Christianity and the person of Jesus Christ, his lordship and who he is. Every other day, the foundations are derailing and people are starting to look at us questioning why in the first place we even waste our time to seek of this God. Sometimes there are people you look at and they are born again for years, for 20, 30 years. And when they start talking, even basic understanding is not in them. And you're like, but Jesus has been made our wisdom, our redemption and our sanctification. How come you speak this way when you profess to have Jesus in your life? Are you following what I'm saying? Now, one time I read a scripture in Ecclesiastes many years ago. In chapter 1, verses 18, and I want to share it a bit. The Bible says, in much wisdom is much grief. And he that increases in knowledge, increases in sorrow. For so long, I never understood. Why then, the wisdom that is supposed to give me answers is bringing grief to my soul. Why the wisdom that is supposed to give me solution is bringing grief to my soul. Why the knowledge that is supposed to, that is increasing on my life, that is meant to bring victory and answers and for I know the truth and the truth makes me free. Even in the freedom that I gi I'm given, I find that sorrow increases in the things we know. It is because when the son of God comes, the Bible says he gives us an understanding. When you receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, there's a certain understanding that ought to enter you. There's a certain way you ought to see certain things. There's a certain thing that, that, that gets a hold of your soul and you start to think differently from the fallen nature. The more wisdom comes to your life, the more knowledge comes to your life, the more firstly, pity and true sorrow comes to you. Why? Because you start to see just how many people don't know and they don't know that they don't know. And it's not even in them to understand that they don't know. And then, at first with a zeal, you labor to help understand. And for some, you win to understand. And then more sorrow hits you because there are people who will never understand. Or at least if they should understand, you will run out of the patience for them to understand. Because sometimes you'll find yourself repeating yourself over and over. And everything said even in the revelation of giving understanding is misinterpreted and misunderstood for something else. That sometimes again it's wisdom to keep quiet because silence cannot be misquoted. But again evil thrives when good men do nothing. So we hold the responsibility of how much we have but yet the silence that comes thereof. And then sometimes you say you know what let me keep on burning this light. Right? 
Because darkness is not an effect. It's not an entity. No, it's simply the absence of light. Continue preaching the gospel. Continue showing the way of the spirit. Continue revealing Christ to those that must understand. Later on, one day, certain things will make sense to some whom it might make sense to. And judgment will befall those that have not understood. But it's still painful that you lose them. Because the true heart of Jesus Christ is clear. He wills that no man perish. The Bible says that all men be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. Sorrow hits you when you start to know certain things that many people don't know. For those of us who are in our 30s, 40s, 50s, you can go back to some of the things we used to do when we were teenagers. Eh? And our parents used to warn us about. Are you hearing me? And somehow our brain could not get it. Because some of us made great mistakes. And then you grow up. And then you say, little teenager, 18, 20, 19, doing the exact thing. You even know why it's going to end. And then you call this fellow and tell him, you know what, brother? The way you're walking, you're going to knock. And the guy will show you that he will never understand. Are you following what I'm saying? There's a sorrow that grips you. Why? Because you see the way of this young man, it's heading to destruction. And even if you try, there is nothing in the world you can do. That gives sorrow to you. But you see, that grief that hits your soul is because you now know what the young man does not know. Who is understanding what I'm saying? You now know what the young man does not know. You now know what the young man does not know. There are things I look back and I, I say, I wish maybe I had my father more. I wish maybe I listened more to my mother. You understand? Because as I grow up now, I see the wisdom from where they spoke things. I'm mature enough to see. Are you hearing what I'm trying to tell you? But then there are people my age who don't see those things. And they're going to become 50 and 40 and 60. And they still don't see those things. Do you understand what I'm saying? And then, you know, sorrow grips you because maybe with this young one, they still have time to change. But then there's this mature person and you're like, but will they change at 90? Will they change at 100? And if they change at that age, will it still be relevant enough to bring the change of the course and assignment God has placed upon your life, their life? And sometimes the answer is no. So with much wisdom comes grief. With much knowledge comes sorrow. And only because you know. In Luke chapter 23, the Bible says when they had come to the place, verses 33, which is Calvary, the Bible says they crucified Jesus and the malefactors and one on the right hand and the other on the left. And then Jesus said, forgive them, Father. The Bible says, forgive them, for they know not what they do. I believe some of these men there, when they heard Jesus saying it, they did not understand what he was saying, but he said it. They would have sat back to say, why is he speaking forgiveness for us? But you know what the scripture says? The moment when he said, forgive them, the Bible says, for they know not what they do. The Bible says, they parted his raiment and cast lots to sell it. The son of God is at the cross at Calvary, purchasing the eternal salvation of my kind. He's crucified by those he came to save. He's shedding his blood by those he came to save. At one particular point, they put uh, prisoners around him, right? One on the left and one on the right. And he looks like he's equal to what these two people have done. The people that led to the crucifixion of Jesus Christ were not unbelievers in the testimony of Moses. They were not unbelievers in the prophets. They were not unbelievers in the core understanding of belief. Because many of them were Pharisees and Sadducees and Essenes. And these are men who beheld the testimony of the Old Testament. But with all that was exposed to them, the man asks them, what should I do to this man? For I find no fault in him. They said, crucify him. And they got the Lord of glory and put him on the cross. And he died. He was beaten. The Bible says he was smitten. He was chicken. Men looked at him and he looked like one afflicted by God. I think those who are watching him were like, this guy, just, he, he must have done something wrong to God. At what age? 33. You know, what has he done? Raising the dead. Cleansing the lepers. 
opening blind eyes, opening deaf ears, purchasing your eternal salvation. That's why Stephen asks them when they're stoning him. You remember? Same issue. Stephen looks up in the sky as they're stoning them. Makes the same statement our master said. He'll allow voice. He says, Father, do not lay this sin on their charge. Don't judge them. Don't kill them. Don't, don't judge them for what they're doing to me. You know why? Because they know not. They know not. And sometimes with that same sorrow comes forgiveness. It ain't bring anger. No, it brings forgiveness. With that same grief comes forgiveness. You feel sorry for the person, but again, you feel you can forgive them. Why? Because the issue is a knowledge issue. They are perishing for a lack of knowledge. There are certain things they cannot see. Even if you get into their heads and, and screw the nuts and put the wires wide, the moment you turn back and tie the brain back, they'll unscrew the wires anyway. And then the Lord Jesus said, forgive them, for they know not what they do. They don't know. They don't know. This price, by grace, to receive the wisdom, to walk in the knowledge of God. If some of you should understand this, it's one of the most imperative things of the Christian faith. To get to know him. He says this is eternal life. That they might know the one true God and his only son Jesus. Because we are perishing for a lack of knowledge. And the Bible says because we the priestly nation have rejected knowledge. Not only are the people out there in the world perishing. But we also are attracting a sort of death. Why? Because we have rejected knowledge. The Bible says some rebel against this light. They know not its parts. They cannot discern the ways thereof. Somebody rebels against the light. He knows that that is the light. But the guy says, no, I'm going to rebel against the light. You understand? And the Bible says, and he that knoweth to do and does not do to him. Okay? But you see, more of the doing is the heart. I'm not talking about the man struggling with alcohol, but he's praying to God every night to take him out. No, I'm talking of a man who is taking, you know, everything and doing everything funny and running himself funny. And then he justifies it. I'm not talking about a man who is struggling with a weakness. Grace came for us. The Bible says he came to make the sinners what? Righteous. He came for the ungodly. He did not come for the righteous. No, he is righteous in making the ungodly righteous. I'm not talking about that person who's saying, you know what, God, I'm struggling with lying. I'm struggling with this. No, no, no. I'm talking about the individual who vindicates himself in the thing he knows is against the light. And for some of them over the years, you look at their lives, and if they're ministers, ministries, and you see that their waters are poisoned, their brooks are dried, they're building a ministry God is not building. They have bruised their destinies. They've scorched their futures. They've breached their spirits. The spirit world, every time the spirit world is open to them, it spells disappointment. It tells them that we don't know you. We don't understand you. And some might live all their lives and die without having seen God in a certain way. There are many, many people I have seen in this life as I've walked in the gospel. And I've seen how some of our ministers in the body of Christ think. And something comes to my head and I'm like, hmm, no wonder. No wonder. Because if the hand of God should set on certain people, we would lose more. Believe me. If the hand of God should set on certain ministers... In this dispensation, the heavens will lose more. The heavens will not gain. The heavens will lose more than it ought to serve. But you see, <laughs> fruit still speaks. Over the years, the results start to separate them. 
And you can see, it doesn't matter how right they can appear, how good they can speak, how articulate they are. At the end of the day, still the results speak to them. And God tells them, you know what? I'm not working with you as you think. I'm not with you as you think. The Bible says that the Lord knows his own. He says that nevertheless the foundation of God standeth sure. Having this seal. The Bible says that the Lord knoweth his own. And if you're called in his name, you learn to depart from evil and certain wickedness and iniquity. There's certain things you learn to disconnect yourself because you know whose you are. See, you can claim you're the Lord's, but God knows his own. Again, I say it. We can claim that we are his own, but God knows his own. Man might not know his own, but God does know his own. Somebody shout hallelujah. Shout hallelujah. So the place there starts to take you and I to a place of asking the questions of what would the righteous do? Because when you, again, I'm saying, I'm still talking about the foundations. When you go back to foundations, the foundations of the church, right? You will see things and ask yourself, how are we here? Why are we even here? How do we think that we are going to profess faith but when our hearts are not right toward God? Why are we asking for the anointing, men of God? Why are we asking for numbers, men of God? Why are we asking for glory, men of God? Why are we asking for God's intervention, men of God? Why are we asking for God's power, men of God? Why are we believing God for people to attend our meetings, men of God? Because he examines our hearts. The Bible says the eyes of the Lord look to and fro. They are looking. And the Bible says he seeks to show himself strong on the behalf of the man whose heart is perfect with him. The perfection of your heart will define how far you go with God. But many of us, when our hearts are examined, they are either displaced because of the ignorance that is in us, or they're displaced because we have been exposed to the light, but we chose to rebel against it because we don't fear God. We don't fear God. We don't fear God. We don't fear God. When as a young boy, in university, I encountered God and there was a great encounter, a great encounter, the anointing started flowing, demonstration of the spirit comes and then the power of God is great on me and I can see it, I could feel it, I could stand in a meeting of five, six people without saying a thing and the power of God goes through men and, and I saw it, I knew that the power of God was present and then I started to look for people who I saw with the same anointing, right? And I remember one time I met a fellow and we went to minister together. And then this fellow was gifted too. So the demonstration of power ensued. He demonstrated power. I demonstrated power. And then after that, we sat in the car to go. We sat in the same car. And while I was in that car, this fellow starts to allude to the meeting that we had. And then he said, you know, We've showed them. So I turned to the fellow, curious, did we show them Jesus? In my head, I was just curious because I was not quick to judge the matter. And then this man starts to go on and on in the boastings of the flesh of how they've seen how much anointing he has and how much power he has and what he is and what he can do and what he thinks he can command. And you understand? And so, being a young minister, I'm, I'm thinking to myself, but we went in the name of Jesus. We performed in the name of Jesus. Our intention that when we raise this Christ up, that he will draw men to himself. But after a long hour of conversation, and those minutes I was not saying anything, but listening, but in my heart sad because of the things I heard, I went back home with a very heavy heart because I realized that every time we stood to demonstrate power, 
Certain people on the same face of the earth saw this power differently. Differently. They saw the anointing as a place of commanding their desires, their personal selfish desires. It was not after Christ. And so out of that sadness, I go on my knees and I start praying. I say, God, where are we missing it? I wasn't judging. I was just asking. And the Lord told me with such, I can never work with. They can, the gifts will continue. But that's not me. I'm not raised there. I'll never draw men to me by them. Because they're not fishers of men. No, they're not fishers of men. The men they fish, they look to eat of and take advantage of. And so over time, I started to ask myself, when we raise our hands, what, why are we raising our hands for the power to move? When we swing our clothes, when we speak words, why are we doing that? Are we doing it because we are led and inspired by the Holy Spirit or are we doing it because we want certain people to qualify us as men of God and what's the end of us being qualified as men of God that we be treated as men of God respected as men of God carry our Bibles carry our glasses carry everything carry us carry so that at the end of the day the anointing qualifies us for privileges without responsibility and then we started using the anointing out of love into something else I saw men would, because he knows he's anointed, he will force somebody to do something contrary to the word because he's a man of God. Force, and I mean force. Whether you're right or wrong, I'm your spiritual father, do this. Even if the scripture is wrong, a man would ignore and rebel against the light because he sees oil on another man. I started to fear because even the positions God had given us, has given us, they did not come with the responsibility to serve men. They came with the responsibility to control and manipulate and abuse men because we are anointed. To take advantage of men because we are anointed. Because I know I'm a man of God. If I tell you God has told me everyone bring 20,000 here, 99% of you would believe me. Why? Because I'm a man of God. But if I should ask for that, because I have a personal need and an idea and a desire that is beyond the leading of the kingdom, then what am I doing to you? Who is following what I'm trying to say? So men got money because they were anointed. The right way, the right way they could not go. No, at the end of the day, you see how many people are selling miracles? How many people are selling prophecies? How many people are selling words of knowledge? Things that were freely given to us. And how many people are buying it? Do you understand what I'm saying? What do we expect them to do? They are desperate. They are sickly. To say the man of God, you have to pay these millions of shillings. If you don't see him, if you don't pay that money, your daughter is going to die. You love your child so much. What do you do? You pay every price to get to the oil. Are you hearing me? And some of us, we had questions. We're like, but how can we sell? How can we sell? So a man's child is going to die because a man of God will not lay hands on this child. Why? Because God anointed him and the man who has brought his daughter does not have enough money to see the man of God. There's a woman whose life and future is in disarray, but they cannot meet the prophet. Or the man of God. Because they've not come with a seed. Do not come to the prophet empty handed. And we understand that. But what if they don't have? You understand what I'm trying to tell you? We became an expensive commodity that is too hard to access. Not because we are very busy serving men. No. But because we are very busy creating our own spaces. And creating a necessary demand of us as a product. Such that we can sell ourselves expensively. And men are buying. Men are buying. Because you're dealing with a generation that does not read its word for itself. 
One time a young girl said, me, if my pastor goes to hell, I'll go to hell. I said, how can you say that? How can you say that? Did this pastor die for you? No, you give yourself to us because you've given yourself to God. You don't give yourself to us above you the way you give yourself to God. And a pastor says, "Uh uh-huh, this one is a true daughter or a son. No, that's not sonship. That's not sonship. That is something else. It's called witchcraft. Who bewitched you to think that you can give your life and die, literally die? No, listen. Again, I'll repeat it, Fanero. I never shed my blood for you. I never. That's the truth. That's the truth. You see, there's questions we men of God can't answer. He says, if any of you regard himself to be greatest, let him be what? Least. Let him be the servant of them all. But how are we like? How are we like? How are we like? Do you understand? So there's things that I start to see in the body of Christ and I'm like, but God, where are we going with this? What will the righteous do? What will the righteous do? A man can spend two hours abusing another man and people are screaming. The whole service. They're screaming. They left their homes. To come and hear another man abuse another man. And they spend a whole service. Are you hearing me? We can't even unite with this same Bible. We can't. We can't. When I went to Soroti to do a crusade. To heal the sick and cast out devils. Do you know who spoke against me? Christians. They started going telling people not to come to the crusades to be healed and receive Christ. Christians. When we went to Ibanda to preach the gospel, do you know who told people not to go for the crusade to be healed and delivered and receive salvation? Christians, pastors, reverends, bishops. When we went to Umbarara, the recent crusade, to preach the gospel, do you know who went door to door telling people not to attend my crusade? It was pastors, bishops, reverends, men of God, who have gone to Bible school, who gave their lives to Jesus Christ and stand every day to preach the gospel of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. No Muslim was against me. No witch doctor was against me. No non-believer was against me. Men who preach this same Bible. When the foundations are out of course, what will the righteous do? Do you know now there are men of God who can't even oh my goodness we can't even talk we can't even we can't why there's something that has entered the body of Christ I don't know what it is some of you even in the same church you can't talk to each other you can't even greet your next neighbor I see I see sometimes I've seen with my own eyes somebody greets another person another person looks like this And then worship starts. And then they raise their hands and say, Rakashite. Brosuko toloba. Zikete rebete. And you're like, <laughs> Woo! When the foundations are destroyed. Do I need to tell that person that God is love? Do I need to tell that person that that the first and second admonishing of a man then regard him a heretic? Because then how can you regard me a heretic when you've never admonished me? If a brother is overtaken by fault, you who are spiritual, restore such a one. But then there's a brother fallen and there are some who are taking advantage of the fallen brother also to attack the fallen brother because they feel now it's their opportunity to attack him because he has also been attacking. You're not different. You're the same. And there's a generation here that doesn't want to know who is right, who is wrong. For it, it wants to know Christ dead and resurrected. A man makes a mistake and somebody says, that's a false prophet. No, he's not a false prophet. He's just a fallen minister. 
He's just a fallen minister. No, but you're taking advantage of that because maybe he also, under his same fallen nature, attacked you. And so now you're also taking advantage also to say now, eh? Uh -huh. even me now, let, you understand? So when he has done what is wrong, you attack what is wrong to establish what is right, but what is not true. Because your heart is not in the restoration. How do I know? Did you call him? When he failed, did you summon two witnesses? When the two failed, did you summon three witnesses? That now at those three, you can say, you know what? We have won this person with this pastor and this man of God and this man of God. Therefore, he is wrong. How then do you go to innocent sheep that don't even know their way to the road? They can't cross the road. And you're telling them to judge matters above them. Are you following what I'm saying? Do you know how much disunity is in the body of Christ? Do you know how many churches suspect each other? No, they don't talk about mosques. They don't talk about shrines. No, they know everyone who is cult, who is demonic, who is under another power, who is of another spirit. Are you hearing what I'm trying to tell you? Let me teach you the standard teaching of the gospel. Listen, the gospel is clear. No man can say that Christ is come in the flesh except by the spirit. Now, you add on your other standards. When the Bible says no man, hereby we know ye are of the spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Christ is come in the flesh is of God. You cannot tell me that a man who is not of God can say Jesus is come in the flesh. He's dead. He's raised to glory. That is watering down the power of God and the gospel. Let me tell you, you cannot just say those statements. He says, hereby we know that ye are of God. Do we speak of Christ coming in the flesh? Do we speak of his death and resurrection? Do we put him there at his place and not replace him by anything? You cannot speak that except by the spirit. If they extra doubt, he says, God tell them that the blind see, the lame walk, the deaf hear, the lepers are cleansed. But you see the first thing Jesus says? The first vindication, he says, the blind see. At least, you, even if you doubt a man or a woman of God, are you hearing me? There is no false prophet that opens the eyes of men to see. There are miracles you can't fake. You can't fake a blind eye seeing. Are you hearing me? More so when you leave the physical eye and go to the spiritual. Whereas you're speaking, a man can find himself in the word. A man can find the wisdom of God. A man can find the revelation of God. A man can wake up tomorrow morning and sit in his Bible and read it. No false prophet can do that. No false prophet can articulate the Bible a certain way. This thing is too hidden to them that are perishing. It is too hidden. That is why they can see anything. They can see for number, but give them Malachi. Open for them Romans. The devil can show you a number, but he can't show you Romans. Because he knows the power in the gospel. He can't open Corinthians. He can't interpret Colossians. This thing is stronger than many of you think. You don't just open it and interpret it. You don't just open the eyes of men. Paul says, and to make all men see. He says, and to make all men see. What is the fellowship of a mystery? It is not easy to show a man through the word. That thing is only spirit breathed. Unless you're a good crammer of great teachers. <laughs> 
Somebody shout hallelujah. Shout hallelujah. And what is the foundation of the church? The word of God. The word of God. Somebody shout hallelujah. In Isaiah chapter 3 and verses 1. They rebelled against the way of the spirit. And they started to go on the way of the Babylonian. And God tells them in the first verse. He says, behold the Lord, the Lord God of hosts. Thus take away Jerusalem and from Judea. He says, because they had gone the way of Babylon. Because they had gone the way of carnality. Because they had given themselves over into indifference. The Bible says he took away. He says he will take away the stay and the stuff. Those words are one and the same. One is feminine, one is masculine. Right? But he's talking about the, the bread. He's, the, the bread and the stay of water. The stay of bread and the stay of water. And bread, the Bible says, is for the strengthening of a man's heart. In other words, he takes away the things that men ought to obviously meditate in their own heart. He takes away the place of their heart. You know, when the devil wants to rob you, he robs you of your thoughts and the meditation of your heart. That is why when he tells you to establish yourself in the word, he says that you might keep your mind and heart in Christ. When your heart and mind is diverted, you start hitting shipwreck without even knowing. God says that the thing that feeds their heart starts to leave. And then they, what do they become? They become evil and heartless people. They become insensitive to the things of God. And the stir of water speaks of the things of this life. The things that bring increase and multiplication of this life. Results, answers, things stop to follow them. Why? Because they've rebelled themselves against the light. And the Bible says, he takes away the mighty man. Nations are weak sometimes because of how much God they have. All the time in fact. Mighty men are taken from a system. The men of war are taken from a system. The judges are taken. Some of you maybe don't understand what I mean. It didn't mean that judges don't exist. But it only means it becomes too expensive to have true justice. You know what I'm talking about. Do you know how many judges and magistrates God has given power to judge matters and only for a little muzzle of meat they have sentenced innocent lives to death. Because the judge has been taken. The prophets are taken. They destroy their own prophets. Are you hearing me? The Bible says the prudent are taken. That means you start to see a nation and a people who don't do things in prudence. There is no matter of order and prudence in them. Everything around them is careless. Even the simplest things in their homes is careless. It's not, out, it's not in line with the things of the spirit. The Bible says it takes away the ancient. Ancient here is not talking about age. No. He's talking about people who are too mature in God. That's what he calls ancient anointing. It's not just age. Some people are old, but they're immature. Are you hearing me? And the Bible says the captain of 50 is taken away. The honorable man is taken away. The counselor is taken away. The cunning artificial is taken away. The eloquent orator is taken away. And then you get to a point where men can't even, you don't have enough to articulate the basics. Because we rebel against the light. And the next verse says, he gives them children to be their princes and babes to rule over them. What happens? Immature people become pastors. Immature folk become men of God. Immature men become spiritual fathers. Men who can't even open this Bible. They can't even open the Bible. They become spiritual fathers. He's like, but the thing you've done, it, you re, do you read the Bible? No, no, me, I know what I'm doing. No, 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 you don't know what you're doing. You can't set yourself against scripture. Are you hearing what I'm trying to say? And the next verse says, and, and, and the Bible says, the people shall be oppressed and everyone by another. That means divisions come. People start fighting each other. They oppress each other and everyone by his neighbor and the child shall behave himself proudly against the earth and the mature one in the spirit and the best against the honorable. That's why you see disrespect in our society. People don't respect even people. Me, there are people, 
With what they have done to me, I would have attacked them long ago, but they're just older than me. That's enough. <laughs> By the way, just because they're older than me. You understand? You find a young girl abusing somebody 20 years older than her, even if that woman is wrong. She's older than you. You know, when I was younger, I used, my father, every time I'd fight with my elder brother, I was the wrong one. The fight two fights fighting, grace. I'm like, but this guy, you, you understand what I'm saying? But he was trying to tell him, tell my head, that when somebody is older than you, there's a certain way you don't go with them. It doesn't matter. Listen, I'm a man of God. I am a spiritual father to many of you who are way older than me. But if you're older than me, there's also another way I talk to you, even if you're wrong. Praise God. Somebody shout hallelujah. And the Bible says, the Bible says, when a man shall take hold of his brother of the house of his father, saying, we go to the level where they say, thou hast clothing, be our ruler. Let this ring be under thy hand. In that day, the Bible says, shall he swear, saying, I will not be a healer, for in my house is neither bread nor clothing. Make me not a ruler of thine people. For Jerusalem is ruined, and Judah is fallen, because their tongue and their doings are against the Lord. They provoke the eyes of his glory. They provoke the eyes of his glory. And the Bible says, they show of their countenance, death witness against them, and they declare their sin as Sodom. They hide it not. Woe unto their soul, for they have rewarded evil unto themselves. Now, they get to a level where a man says, you know what? Be my pastor because you have a nice suit. Be my man of God because you drive a nice car. Be my ruler because you live in a nice house. Be my spiritual authority because you have money. Since when did the power of God shift from the anointing and wisdom? to money and politics. Then now we define men because of how much influence they have, either with those who are mighty and the connections that they have, or with how much money they have on their account. Then we say, this is a man of God. Now the eyes, we provoke the eyes of his glory. We, we provoke we, everything that we know of God. Now it's starting to become funny. You, you understand what I'm saying? We, we can know that this is true and still refuse to do what is true before God. Somebody asked me, will wars ever cease between born again Christians? I told him 100% no. And he asked me why. And I told him this is why. Because for the, for the body of Christ to get to a certain place where we carry a certain unity, there has to be a place where we agree in the message. And certain people will never agree with the message of grace. They can't believe that God can forgive. And forget. They can't. It's so hard for them. It's so hard. And you see in how they deal with the fallen. You see in how they deal with the weak. You see in how they deal with the struggling. You see in how they respond to men who are weak. You can see. Moses is there. He's laying guard every time seeking who to kill. Do you understand what I'm saying? Now we have young men who also want to be men of God. And every example almost that has been set in the life of this young man is wrong. And he begins his first steps the wrong way. You can almost tell he will not make it for two years in the gospel. Because when the blind lead the blind, they fall in a what? In a ditch. But he tells us, say ye to the righteous that it shall be well with them for they shall eat of the fruits of their doing see righteousness is not just a doctrine it positions us into right works hallelujah it positions us into right works there are men who no longer give a damn how many people are destroyed as long as their end is gain 
There are men who don't give a damn about how many people die as long as their end is gain. There are men who don't care about how many innocent souls are misled as long as their end is gain. There are men who don't give a damn anymore that Jesus died for those people. And they say they are men and ministers of God. And these are people we entrust our souls to. To become the shepherds of our souls. Some of you think that Uganda is just a corrupt nation because our people are corrupt. No. Everything you see out there is exactly what is in the church. Why? Because the corrupt fellow who embezzled billions of shillings has a Christian name. And they sat under a Christian teacher at a certain point in life. All these things you see in our nation that, are, that sometimes cause you to open your eyes and say, what is happening? Mark you, th many of them are Christian names and they had an opportunity to be led to Christ and show the right way. But somebody, when he had an opportunity at that particular point, he chose to lead them another course. Do you know how many people have left the church and they're in the world and have given their souls to the devil because of us men of God who open these Bibles every Thursday and speak every Friday, every Monday, every Tuesday, every Sunday. God have mercy on us. God help us. Even the, na the voices of this nation cannot listen to us because even as we are speaking, we look strange already. Praise God. But that has to change. A time has got to come when a generation can know God for itself. A time has got to come when you can see that this is wrong and you don't do it. A time has got to come when you can say, you know what? And for me, I feel sorry for the young generation, our people. Because 70 something percent of our population is youth. Some of them... That confusion came very early. And you will tell after 10, 20 years, they will never do even 0.0000% of what they could have been in this life. Why? Because they've set themselves against the thing that should have redeemed them. Fanero Christians, when you hear men waging war on social media, keep quiet. It's the only way they will know we are different. When you hear people fighting you, the only thing is pray for them. Send them love cards and blessings. Are you hearing me? When you sit around people discussing things that are ungodly about ministries, walk away. That's not why you were born again. That's not even why. It's not even a quote of what God called you to do. Somebody told me, you see, do you know why some of us can't reply certain people? Because we don't want to look like them. We will lose another generation also. We will lose another generation also. Another generation will come in and say, ah, you see, even that one is fine. Woo -wee. Listen, some of us can't fight because with the wisdom we have, if we chose to put it to evil, we would fight so dangerously. <laughs> Praise God. But God saved us. He redeemed us and changed us. You read it and look away. Hallelujah. You hear it and speak in tongues and dance in your house and add more chairs. And wait for the day of calamity. Because sentence on an evil work is done slowly. And the Bible says, and therefore, the hearts of men continue to do wicked. And wait when it hits them. When it hits them, you get food and shelter and send. And tell them we love you. <laughs> Praise God. Put calls of fire on your enemies. Somebody shout hallelujah. Let us stop these divisions that are in the body of Christ. Let us kill those things. At least in Fanero. Let us kill those things that divide sins. Don't be a part of that story. If people are fighting men of God, don't be a part of that war. Walk away and speak in tongues. Listen to a sermon on Meraki and Calopsia. Somebody shout hallelujah. No man who has done even a quarter of what I've done can fight me. And that's true. And I've never seen them. I've never seen a man who has done even a quarter of what I've done. And they're fighting me. Because they know the price of souls. They know what Jesus. 
paid to have them there. They understand that every soul is precious. Praise God. Saints, we have to pray for our nation. Everything you see that is out of line, believe me, it's us men of God. It's the church. Once the church is straight, this nation will shine. But don't be deceived. The problem is not with those men who are corrupt. Let's not even criticize guys out there without even understanding the rot that is in the body of Christ. Take time always to pray for your nation. Take time always to pray for the body of Christ at large. You'll be amazed at the things God will do in your life. Take time to take responsibility. When you see a fallen brother, go on your knees and pray for them. When you see a fallen man of God, go genuinely on your knees and say, God, help this individual that we do not lose them. Why? Because if this generation also does not learn, imagine the next generation of Christianity. Imagine the next generation of Christianity. A man approached us and he said, believers, pay us to mud slay you. Can you believe it? That's when we started praying seriously for this nation. How can a believer pay social media to mud slay another believer? Not a witch doctor. No, someone who says they are a believer. Now what about those innocent souls that are misled in the process? that will never be re restored because they were given a different picture from the truth because somebody needs to win that particular battle. Why did Jesus send us? So, what is our stand on those things? You've heard me. We pray. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. Now, I just want you to raise your hands and just pray for the church. 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 Just pray. Don't judge. Don't criticize. No. You just pray for the church. And say, God, now I see the responsibility of how much you've showed me. Just pray for the church. Because there are things our children should not find. There is reproach our children should never see. There are things my great-grandchildren should never know of God. Pray for the body of Christ. Pray for the church of Jesus Christ. Pray to God that he will bring unity in the body of Christ. Pray to God that he will bring reconciliation in the body of Christ. Pray to God that he will bring peace in the body of Christ. Pray to God that he will bring forgiveness in the body of Christ. Pray to God that he will bring understanding and knowledge in the body of Christ. Just pray to God. Pray for your nation. Pray Even if you're not a Ugandan, many of the things that I'm speaking attach every part of the world. It's the body of Christ. Pray for our fellow believers. Pray. Just take a minute and pray. Please pray. For the sake of the gospel. For the sake of the ministry. That the ministry be not blamed. Just pray. We cannot continue fighting each other like this Lord. We cannot continue in disunity like this God. We cannot continue in anger like this God. We cannot continue in ignorance like this God. We cannot continue in indifference like this God. We cannot continue in misunderstandings like this God. We cannot continue in wars that are censuring a cross. We cannot continue like that. We can't. We can't. We can't. We can't. supposed to look to us for answer whether we are apostles whether we are prophets 
whether we are teachers, whether we are pastors, whether we are evangelists. The word of God must be standard and key in everything that we do. Help us God. Come and somebody pray for your nation. Pray for your nation. Pray for the world. Pray for the church. We can't manipulate our own. We can't abuse our own. We can't take advantage of the people God has given us. God, help us. states the word and say look but this is what the word says be on the side of the word always don't ever set yourself against the word because you can only destroy yourself and if you don't understand me you could think that I'm attacking no I am way past that level unless you don't know me but I carry a true true heart of pain when I see the people Christ died for that even in heaven I wonder whether we shall sit together. Yet drunkards get their brown bottles and sit together and drink. Young men get weed and share the same stick of weed and get high and carry themselves over into sleeping beds. Drunkards bail themselves out of prisons. But men who are sober killing each other every day. I'm not against an evangelist, but evangelize according to the word. I'm not against a prophet who sees and says this. The prophetic is relevant. But as far as the Lord can show you about an individual, let him show you the word as well. It says that the word and the spirit can agree. I'm not against a healing minister or an evangelist or an apostle. No. I'm only saying we cannot claim oil that does not come with the maturity that God desires of it. We cannot claim an anointing that does not come with the responsibility of it. Praise God. Now, if you have never given your life to Christ and you want to be born again, repeat these words after me. Say, Lord Jesus, tonight, I have heard you and your word. My heart believes. My mouth confesses that you died and rose again for my glory. Tonight, I'm born again. I receive you as my Lord and Savior. Amen. The message you have just heard was brought to you by Fenero Ministries International. For more information, contact us on telephone number 
1-800-242-4291 or email us at funerocompala at gmail.com. You can also find us on the web at www.funero.org. Or better still, feel free to join us every Thursday for our weekly fellowships at UMA Multipurpose Hall from 5 p.m. to 8 p.m. You can also catch the live stream at livestream.com slash Fenero. Fenero. Make manifest.